Hi, and welcome to The Horn, a podcast from International Crisis Group. I'm Alan Boswell, and today I'm joined by our Africa program director, Comfort Aero. Comfort is here to actually interview me this time and to guest host The Horn podcast, and uh, I'll let her take it away from here. And it's a pleasure to um, be interviewing Alan, who's just uh, arrived from from Juba and from South Sudan, where he had been following very closely the South Sudan peace deal, the the formation of the unity government, which finally agreed to on the 22nd of February this month. Many questions to ask him, but I should explain to our listeners um, that Alan is actually our South Sudan um, senior analyst, even though he's also the host of the the Horn podcast. Awesome. I'm uh, super happy to be sitting in the hot seat for once. So take it away. It's all yours now. The very first thing I want to do is to quote back to you what you said in your in one of your messages on Twitter and I quote this is a huge moment that may seem in history as the bookend for South Sudan's long civil war will this new government Alan work can it end the the war I think this unity government might end up serving as the bookend uh, when we go back in history for South Sudan's civil war. Of course, it it may not. But I think at the moment, there is some ground for hope. Um, I will say that, you know, President Kiir actually in his speech swearing in the vice president officially declared the war over, you know, so the South Sudan's leaders themselves are trying to send a message. One of the main reasons why I think there's some grounds for what I would call cautious optimism at the moment is that these two leaders had already stopped fighting for over a year. So there was already signs that they were ready to at least end the conflict. Now, what we had, I think, from the peace deal in 2018 was that we had an a ceasefire that was more or less successful. But the problem had been that really those final peace terms were were not yet settled. And so, and those ended up, of course, being the stickiest issues. You, in these peace negotiations, you often leave the hardest issues for last. And that was the case in this one. Um, and then what was needed this time was to, was to get them to finally agree on some final really key issues, which is what we saw really only in the last week uh, ahead of this uh, unity government, which is one of the reasons you said it was actually a surprise because we'd been stuck and deadlocked at the same spot really almost since this peace deal was signed. But now I think we can actually see things moving forward. And there are some uh, th- there are some important differences between this time and the last time they formed a unity government. The last time, of course, failed and collapsed. Um, and there are some key differences this time around. Well, let's focus on that because... We recall what happened in 2016, and here we are, you know, 2018 September, a new peace deal was struck, which wasn't very different from what we saw in 2016. So what's the, what's the difference this time round? Why, why did we manage to secure the 22nd of February deal? I would call the what happened in 2016 really a shotgun wedding. Salva Kiir and Riyak Machar, neither of them seemed really keen to form this government, but Salva Kiir signed the peace deal under heavy duress. Him and um, key lieutenants under him basically immediately set about to undermine the agreement. Meanwhile, Riyak Machar was not at all ready to come back to Juba. It took heavy pressure, including the public threat of sanctions from the U.S. government, to get him to come to Juba, and he only returned by flying in his own private militia into the capital with him. And the reason we saw that peace deal collapse was not only because of the political deadlock that immediately happened once they formed this government, but it was also because, you know, I mean, because he flew in his own private militia, every time these two would meet, for instance, at the presidential palace, you'd have President Kiir's hardcore bodyguards, his elite force, sitting there standing, basically with their hands on the trigger, staring down uh, Riyak Machar's um, elite bodyguard force. And these are, you know, these are forces that have spent not just years, but decades really fighting each other. And that and and what happened in the way the war, the way the that peace deal actually broke down was that while they were meeting in the presidential palace, gunshots rang out between those two. But some of that, sorry to cut you off, but some of that is still present, even and that was still present on the 22nd. So, Mm -hmm. you know, there's a sense in which sanctions this time also Mm -hmm. played played a role. Mm -hmm. Um, Riyak Mishal's forces sort of surrounding uh, the periphery of, of, of Juba and the sense in which also 
And we, I wanted to, to get into this, the sense in which the region itself pressured the two, the two leaders. None of, none of them naturally came to the table this time around. So, so I, I understand what you're saying, that the optics may be different, but some of those characteristics are still very much alive in, as to why we got to where we got to. Yeah, and, and the reason why I'm you know, not saying we're straight out optimistic mm-hmm. and I'm trying to caveat that is it's very obvious and true that this is basically the same structure mm-hmm. of not only a peace deal that has failed quite explosively before, um, but also a repeat of a power sharing government and arrangement that has failed several times in the past. Of course, this was the arrangement that even led to the outbreak of civil war was that Riyak Machar was Kier's uh, vice president, and he started challenging him for the leadership. And we're going to see that exact same thing play out. So I think in some ways what we've seen, um, some of the signs I'm pointing to are a matter of the fact that both leaders, I think, seem to appear to recognize in their own way that this was the only way to really move out of the conflict. Um, I think they hadn't reached that point, either of them yet. Um, by 2016. But then more specifically, yes, Riyak Machar's forces are around the outskirts. Mm -hmm. He surely has guys in the capital in case, you know, in case of contingency plans. It's still different than him uh, every time, for instance, that he meets with the president, that his forces are officially there. That's just a that's just to me a categorically different, uh, different scenario. Um, and and so hopefully we don't just see hopefully they're not creating this tinder box where basically anything that sparks off can kind of uh, blow up and inflame the country. The other thing I'd like to highlight is that last time some key political disputes that were there when they formed the government this time got resolved in the final week. And then we can talk about how the region really helped push them there. And the main one being this issue over how many states are in the country, the configuration of it when they formed their government in 2016. President Kier had formed 28 new states. This was disputed. That meant they couldn't uh, form local power sharing arrangements. They couldn't appoint governors. This couldn't push down. The government was immediately deadlocked. Um, And it was one of the reasons tensions started building as soon as they formed this government, because they were really stuck on this. The other one was on the security arrangements in terms of unifying their two forces together. That one also in 2016, they hadn't even officially started cantonment, Mm -hmm. let alone starting to try to re-amalgamate their forces together um this time that whole process is delayed and is is quite a mess but it's not contested in the way that it was in in 2016 so so there's a sign that maybe we've already gotten past the key roadblocks that were there in 2016 now it's a matter of getting these two to be honest honestly be able to work together enough and to be statesmen enough which many people will be skeptical they ever can be, but he states many enough to at least recognize that the sort of same way they're doing politics really risks bringing this country back into conflict. I think let's step back a bit um, for our listeners. Why did the country descend into civil war? You know, what was that war ab- about? But how did we get to, to war in the first place? I think the best way to think about South Sudan's civil war that broke out in 2013 is that it was part of the independence of the country in a way. This was sort of the unfinished process of a new nation is born, and then now the political struggle to determine who will rule this new country. Um, so, And what really we saw happen was that South Sudan's elites, including these two men, banded together in the run-up to the country's independence. And then as soon as they got independence, the question became basically who was going to who was going to rule the country and the problem was that south sudan is such a fragile state that the minute their different elites started competing against each other these are men with their own militias mm-hmm. basically mostly on ethnic lines the what was considered the national army the spla was basically just an amalgamation of all these forces and and basically the country was unable to withstand basically this this political power struggle over who would who would rule the country. So so what happened is Riyak Machar started challenging Kier and others, not just Riyak Machar, but others started challenging Kier uh, as the lead of the ruling party, uh, the SPLM. And he was fired as vice president. And this led to escalating tensions. And then eventually, because of this, um, the there was an attempt to disarm Riyak Machar's uh, actually not even Riyak Machar's. There was an attempt to disarm the um, some of the forces that came from Riyak Machar's ethnic group, the New Ware, and and this led to tensions, and eventually, again, gunshots broke out, and then you just saw widespread ethnic violence 
um, in the capital that eventually that eventually sort of after everything shook out ended up turning into this very long civil war. So the short answer of how we got here is that is that after independence, this was just a power struggle between two people in the country that was really too fragile to be able to withstand that and 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 with elite who were not careful enough. So here we are, days after the 22nd um, of, of February. And I wanted to unpack because one of the things that we have really heavily focused on at, at Crisis Group is the role of the region. What what was the region's role this time around? I think what's really critical to remember is that this peace deal came about in 2018 mm -hmm. because of the strong um, urgency, basically, that came from Sudan and Uganda to finally strike this peace deal. What we saw after that peace deal was struck near the end of 2018 was that then those regional leaders basically took a step back. And it wasn't, it wasn't just them taking a step back. It was also a product of the level of political upheaval that we've had in the Horn. So, of course, this deal was largely brokered by President Bashir of Sudan, who then fell from power. Mm -hmm. um, Ethiopia, who previously had been the mediators um, of the of the peace deal, was going through its own, you know, major sort of political revolution there. And so what we had uh, after this peace deal in 2018 is that the the region really took a step back for a quite a long time. And you know, I think a lot of listeners will know that although they finally formed this unity government in South Sudan, it took a lot of delays. Um, it, it was supposed to form some nine months ago, and there was twice that they missed a deadline to form it. Our reading at the time of that whole thing was that basically this peace deal was spinning its wheels, specifically because the, the mediators had left the room. Right. And so they were really unable to really bridge these final gaps because there was no high-level mediation between the two. There was mediation at a lower level, but not between these two. What we saw now in this last month in February was that finally, I'd say for the first time since 2018, honestly, uh, finally we saw the regional leaders themselves, the other heads of state, sit down with these two and really demand compromise on key issues. And so that was the kind of final step. And it really took all of those, you know, and also also from the international community, there was escalating mm -hmm. pressure as well. So I don't mean to leave them out of the equation. No, and, I, and I wanted to, uh, uh, before turning to the international community, I, I wanted to also ask you... You know, again, to get a sense of how much of this was imposed or not imposed, and how much was this the realization of Salva Kiir and Riak Mashar themselves? For for Riak Mashar himself as as well, he's been accompanied in this process um, by by one particular figure, um, General Hemeti from 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 Sudan. His default position has always been to run back to Sudan for for some kind of guarantee. What has been his precise role? And what has he had to do to reassure or to cajole or to urge or nudge Riak Mashar to stay in the room and to accept the 22nd of February deal? One of the really striking things about this entire process has been how intertwined now mm -hmm. the events in Sudan and events in South Sudan really are, um, especially through the role of General Hameti, mm -hmm. like you said. General Hameti has been coming to Juba, spending his time uh, negotiating with, with the armed groups of Sudan in the Juba-based peace talks. At the exact same time, he's been sort of flying in with Riyak Machar to serve as essentially, like you said, a security guarantor for him in Juba during these peace talks. Now, a lot of times in, in, uh, <laughs> in politics in this region, uh, what we we can see who is in the room, and then it can be very difficult to really find out exactly what role they're playing. But you can tell that someone's playing a very big role, and this is the case with with General Hameti. He was often the only, he was usually the only non South Sudanese in the room in these talks between Kier and Machar, leading down to the final to the final settlement. And that that was, uh, you know, most people think that that was more than just security guarantor, that there's a lot of interlinked pieces now going on in the politics, if, even if you will, the political marketplace um, mm -hmm. uh, between these two countries and dealing with the peace talks now taking place with the Sudanese armed groups and also this 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 new coalition. Two more questions around sort of the external dimension of how we got to 22nd, the role of the internationals. I want to specifically zoom in um, on two sort of two actors 
those. Um, one is the United States, and then the other one is is, is the role of of the Church and the Vatican. But let's start with with the U.S. because a couple of weeks before the twenty second, the the U.S. announced the appointment of a new new envoy who who arrived, and also this you know in the last sort of few months as well, we saw the the U.S. impose sanctions on on South Sudan, and I'd like to get a sense from you, Alan, as to what role the sanctions played as part of the, the, the pressure points used to get us to the 22nd and what now in terms of the role of the envoy? We've been calling for a long time, like you said, for the U.S. to re-up its engagement mm-hmm. on South Sudan and to reappoint a special envoy, which, as you said, they recently just did. Ambassador Stuart Symington is now the new U.S. special envoy. Like you said, this was very late. It's only in the past few weeks, really, that he had come in. He he came to Juba uh, for the first time, essentially right before these kind of uh, final pieces were, were in place. So I think he'll be very key moving forward. Um, and the U.S. will be key moving forward in terms of trying to keep the regional pressure up. And the reason I say that, and the reason we've always been really encouraging more U.S. engagement, this region, the Horn of Africa, is without a regional hegemon. It's a region that's quite divided. You have many heads of state who um, like to head their own direction and are quite strong-willed. And the role that the U.S. often played was what I would call mediating the mediators. Mm role. It was the outside role that helped keep the help would push and pull and cajole regional leaders. And and also because they all have their own priorities. Um, They're often distracted by domestic things, but also their own their own strategic interests and and other regional issues. And to keep them and help kind of help do that shuttle diplomacy to sort of try to keep a coherent pressure on on South Sudan and sustained action. And what we've seen is when the U.S. stepped out of that role, there is really no one else to really fill it. Now, I'm not sure it's really the U.S.'s role to play that entirely. I think, for instance, we've been hoping South Africa um, really steps up um, and does that. In some ways, they have been. So I think it's more of an all hands on deck now. Mm-hmm. Um, but I do think that U.S. role had always historically been important. It was the role they played largely um leading up to the 2005 Comprehensive Peace Agreement, which is what ended Sudan's civil war and led to South Sudan's independence and the role they'd played previously. So that was the role we were hoping for. Like you said, they had been escalating sanctions um, and there had been private meetings with both Kiir and Riyak Machar in the weeks leading up to this, um, not just from the new special envoy, but from the top U.S. diplomat on Africa, uh, Assistant Secretary of State Tibor Naji as well. Um, and... And, you know, I think very harsh messages were were delivered um, and likely threats um, of more punitive action against these two. Most people who I've spoken to think that these both these escalating sanctions and the and the threats of more played a role in in the final calculations Mm -hmm. of these two um, and also trying to meet the actual deadline. And specifically on on, on the church, Mm -hmm. I mean, we saw last last April this highly symbolic um, sort of spiritual retreat that took place in in Rome, headed by 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 the papacy, by the Pope, and that final act by the Pope him, himself, you know, kneeling down on his knee on his knees and kissing the feet of both 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 leaders. I mean, Savake himself has often made references back to that. And on Saturday himself, on the on the twenty second, he he talked about forgiveness and and reconciliation. Um, what has been the role of of the churches and specifically um, the Vatican? I know it's a, it's a they they themselves are, are very sensitive about their roles and they don't want to see themselves as political actors. Can you give us a little insight into the role of the churches and and the Vatican specifically? Yeah, like you said, the 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 church has really played a really key role, and this goes back to the sort of all hands on deck sort of approach that I think was necessary to even get to this point in the peace process. Um, South Sudan, I mean, when it fell into civil war, one of the challenges is that South Sudanese society was so divided, it was it was difficult to find civil institutions uh, that could really help mediate it domestically. You know, in Kenya, you have a strong business community that can step in sometimes during during political troubles and help mediate. In South Sudan, really, the church is the only is really the only sort of uniting countrywide civil institution. And we saw really strong action, not just from South Sudan's own church leaders, but we saw, you know, really unprecedented levels of engagement and ecumenical um, coordination, Mm -hmm. um, because it didn't just come from the Vatican. Mm -hmm. 
Um, it also came, they also coordinated with the Archbishop of Canterbury um, um, in Lambeth Palace there in London. And, and my understanding is that 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 uh, partnership is, is very unusual and, and unprecedented. And also the uh, the Presbyterian Church as well. And, and I should say the the church leaders themselves, the South Sudanese church leaders, have also been going around doing shuttle diplomacy, meeting with regional leaders, regional heads of state, not just with church, playing a very senior role, also talking to the leaders themselves, sometimes in very stark languages, demanding it's time to end this war. So what, in the end, Alan, do you see as you know, the most immediate priority to ensure that what we secured on the 22nd of February holds? I think what's really key here is for a message to continue to go to these two, that this is not sort of the final point everyone was asking them to do, um, but this is the first stop, basically, in what will be a very long journey, and to act diligently that even as, of course, they're representing their own political interests, that they have to be careful about the rhetoric they're saying, about the message they're sending to their hardliners, and just continue, I think, to recommit publicly that they do not want to bring this country back into conflict. I really think at a top line level, and some of this is symbolic and some of it's concrete steps, but for the reasons you mentioned, these two, if they just go back to doing what everyone expects them to, which is to immediately start competing and mobilizing, preparing for elections against each other, which is, of course, how this war broke out, which is that these two started mobilizing to compete against each other politically. Um, because of that, and because they're that basically the campaign, you know, for a presidency between these two in some ways starts starts now. It it they just really, really, really need to do things differently. You know, this can't be business as usual for mm-hmm. politics in South Sudan. It has to be a sort of national understanding that yes, we're gonna we're gonna be moving this forward, but we we can't um we, we, we can't be kind of willy nilly mm-hmm. about the rhetoric we're using, about how we're handling our own forces. Mm-hmm. This has to be a, I think a sort of deep sense of commitment. And obviously a lot of people are skeptical that these two mm-hmm. will do that. And I th- and, and we obviously agree with that. Um we are we're we're looking for optimism and hope where we can find it and trying to press where we can, but but uh there's a reason that this arrangement has failed several times in the past. You know, one of the big sticking points or two of the big sticking points has been around the security arrangement, the protection of Riyak Mashar um, was always one of the big issues that we needed to address. But the the equally more fundamental one um, that led also to the collapse in in, in 2016 was around, you know, the the question of the the national unified um, army. You know, will these two armies um, ever really um, come together as one? Can we ever see... Um, the 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 birth of one national unified army in in South Sudan. This month, I went um, and visited uh, uh, Wow, which is a major town in South Sudan, and also went up to a place called Raja. And this is one of the main questions I was looking at, both at how the actual training camps where they've started to train some of these joint quote unquote unified forces together are going, but also to see how the whole process of assembling all these rebel and opposition forces together was really moving forward. And what you find, honestly, is that it's a it's a total mess. Um, this is a process that will that is extremely troubled. It's really far delayed, but it also suffers from many incentives that are very difficult to fix, meaning that because both sides want to uh, feel secure in their proportion, the national army, they've been recruiting heavily. So you have massive recruitment going on at the moment um, uh, on both sides to fill these slots. Um, but then what you also find is that they're, they're really uh, strong forces on both sides. Their main forces can, are continuing to sit outside this sort of unification process. So you end up sending oftentimes your newly recruited forces to the training sites, including civilians, including uh, the wives, what seem to be clearly oftentimes the wives of the fighters themselves. They're the ones who are sent to sort of unify. And then the main fighters are sort of sitting outside the process waiting Um, for a future time to come back. The other problem is that the opposition forces themselves are highly divided amongst each other. So by forcing these guys to assemble, you've had commanders who've, who've had their own rivalries going on within the opposition forces who are now being told to assemble their forces at the same spot. And that's led to infighting in both of the areas I've gone to uh, because of their own internal rivalries. So this is a process I expect to last for years. I think it's highly likely that as we near elections, if those elections do near as they're scheduled to, that both sides will effectively still have their own standing armies. 
Um, and we should be realistic about that. And it's one of the reasons that with our work moving forward as crisis group, we will be starting to focus at some at some local level things where, where we think are of places where are at particular risk for having some of these armed groups go back to conflict over local issues, despite how the national peace process is moving forward. And of course, there's going to be a lot of sort of horse trading as well, you know, especially over who's going to occupy key government positions. And going back to your whole issue of the state boundaries as well, of course, no powerful local governorships, 32 governors have, have lost their lost their position mm-hmm. now so the, the the question also is how you how you deal with them how you mm-hmm. compensate them in a sense and it's not maybe a word that a lot of people wouldn't want to hear but how you compensate them mm-hmm. to make sure that they also stay in 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 the room and don't become spoilers as well getting to this unity government was not easy it took very painful compromises from both Kier and Machar to get there on Kier's end he dissolved 32 government 32 state governments yeah. that's mm-hmm. that's firing 32 governors um, and all their state cabinets. You know, I was on the ground when I showed up in a place and all of a sudden they had no government. You know, I'd have to find there was no governor, there was no acting governor, no acting commissioner. I mean, it was a really sort of surreal time to be on the ground. Um, that's That comes at a real political cost. There's definitely people who are quite angry um, and groups who had been given states who now are being amalgamated back with, with everyone else, you know, um, you know, that's a real political cost. And of course the one on Macharzan was agreeing to come back to Juba without really his maximal security demands being met and essentially saying, okay, president Kier, whose, whose forces have twice chased me out of the capital, fleeing for my life. I now agree to come back and accept basically your security guarantee. I trust in the... you to protect mm-hmm. me. Yeah. Or at least I'm agreeing to, yeah. to, to trust you to right. whether or not he actually does, of course, is a whole nother ris- question. It's risky. It's risky mm-hmm. on both ends. This mm-hmm. was, this was mm-hmm. quite risky. And the risk on that for, for Machar side is not just personal security, but also political mm-hmm. because many of his hardline forces will view this as essentially him caving in, if not outright surrendering basically his own security mm-hmm. to Kier's forces. So on both ends, we saw really major compromises that happened in the final week. And that attests to what can happen when everyone, and in, in most specifically the regional heads of state, really pressure these two and really force the issue. You know, we focused our entire conversation on, on these two leaders, you know, and, and the deal between them, you know, and sort of calling it a, a leap packed in, you know, making sure that, that they, they stay in, in, in the room. But let's Let's end our conversation sort of focusing on the South Sudanese themselves and the the cost of war, unspeakable human suffering. You know, what does this mean for for South Sudanese? To travel around South Sudan during the civil war and and still is just to, you know, travel through utter devastation, Mm -hmm. through a completely broken country um, and a completely really broken and 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 really divided people um, as a nation um, you go through um, empty settlements you know you'll you, uh, throughout the country just villages completely emptied in a lot of the major towns you might find a core little a core little market um, but it might have 90 percent of its population having left you'll just drive and you'll just go through empty home after empty home with no with no roofs the roofs stripped off the walls caved in. Um, and when you say that, a lot of people immediately go, oh, they'll need major reconstruction. And I think it's something way more beyond that, which is that this was a war that pitted, you know, neighbor against neighbor in South Sudan. Um, and I think the core challenge for South Sudan is that where it started as a country um, in 2011, it had never really managed to fuse together this national identity and where it was both economically in development, but also in terms of nation building as a South Sudanese people, where it was in 2011 when it got independence. Um, we are now so far back from that that it'll take so long to even, I think, get back to that point. And that underscores the real sort of challenges. And I think it's it's just going to require, it's going to require the work of generations, not only to rebuild, but to but it, but to actually you know fuse together South Sudan again. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a very sobering way in which to end um, our conversation, Alan, to remind us of you know of of the heart of the matter, and you know a nation that has been wrought by 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 war and how it picks itself up, and starts focusing on those sort of short term, immediate sort of peace dividends, but then more long term struggle for reconciliation and, and and justice and and harmony and and peace among among the people. But thank you very much. Thank you. It's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank you, Comfort. Thank you for coming on and uh, taking my spot for an episode.
Thanks for listening. You can find out more about Crisis Group and read our reports at crisisgroup.org. Once again, I'm Alan Boswell. This episode was produced by Mae Francis. 